Hi everybody, this is Kaylee from Belmont Books. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the event. Thank you all for joining tonight and we do apologize again for the confusion and the switch to Crowdcast and then back to Zoom. Um, we had such a really tremendous amount of interest in this event that we were hoping to open it up to be available to more people, um, but just due to technical difficulties, Crowdcast didn't work out. Um, but we're hoping that Zoom will really give you the best possible image quality and sound quality um, and really have a great event tonight. So um, with that said, um, let's go ahead and get started. So um, before we go to the authors, I have a few housekeeping details for everybody. Um, first, we will have a short Q&A at the end of tonight's event. So go ahead and put any questions and comments that you have for the authors in the chat um, right down there. Um, I'm going to be reading the chat and collecting them throughout the night, so then we'll be able to ask them at the end of the evening. We do have a lot of people on this event, so chances are we won't have a chance to get to all the questions, um, but we'll do as many as we can. Um, second, Belmont Books is offering curbside pickup again, um, so if you want to use this option for tonight's books or any books that you have to, to order, um, just order your books online through belmontbooks.com. Um, and when you get to the option for shipping, you're gonna select curbside pickup. And the days that we are doing the curbside pickup are Monday through Friday, two to 6 p.m. And Saturday is 12 to four. So we hope that all of you can take advantage of that. Um, finally, some upcoming events. We have a lot of events coming up. We have events for um, kids, we have book groups, we have reading events. Um, but I'm just going to highlight a few of them for adults because it seems like this is an, an adult event tonight. Um, so first, this coming Monday, June 22nd, we'll have an Instagram live event with Madeline Miller, the author of Circe, and Sue Monk Kidd, whose latest novel is The Book of Longings. On Tuesday, June 23rd, we'll have an event with Sarah Blake. She's the author of The Guest Book and Claudia Ranking. Um, her new book, Just Us, is available now for pre-order, and that's coming out in September. Um, finally, on June 30th, we'll have romance authors Sarah Vogel and Martha Waters, and they're going to be in conversation with our own resident romance expert, Amanda. So with that, let's go ahead and get to tonight's big event. Um, I'll be reading the introductions, and then we'll have them up on stage, um, and you'll get to hear from them. So Jessica Treadway is the author of six books, including four novels. Her fiction has earned her awards from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Cultural Council, as well as the Flannery O'Connor Award for Fiction. She is a former member of the Board of Directors of Penn New England, where she served as co-chair of the Freedom to Write Committee. She is also a senior distinguished writer in residence in the Department of Writing, Literature and Publishing at Emerson College, and her sixth novel, The Gretchen Question, was released this month. Julia Glass is the author of six books of fiction, including the best-selling Three Junes, winner of the National Book Award, and I See You Everywhere, winner of the Binghamton University John Gardner Fiction Book Award. A recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, Glass is also a senior distinguished writer and resident at Emerson College. Her most recent novel is A House Among the Trees. So welcome Jessica and Julia. Is Julia on the screen? Yes. There she is. I think so. <laughs> Am I here? I think I'm here. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and go dark and I'll see you at Great. the end. Great. Thanks, Kaylee. Okay, uh, Jessica, I can't see you at the moment, but- um, yeah. You know what I look like. Oh, okay, there you are. Okay, so um, this is my first Zoom book event, and as Jessica and I were, were just saying, um, it's more nerve-wracking than we thought, and I am so um, amazed, gobsmacked, to see the number 93 at the bottom of my screen. I'm not even sure that many people could fit into the bookstore. So first, I want to thank uh, Belmont Books for making this happen, overcoming all our technical difficulties, uh, and making our books available. Uh, as, as everybody knows who, who's a book lover, it's been a really tough time for bookstores. And to those who have been able to continue uh, mail ordering books, doing sidewalk pickup, <clears throat> we're all so grateful. So uh, thank you, Stacy and, and Kaylee. Uh, so I want to 
first, I want to start by just describing briefly my experience of reading this beautiful novel of Jessica's. So Jessica actually, I kind of had to wrench it away from her to, to read it early. And, and I read it on my computer because it wasn't available in galleys yet. And I hate that experience. But I started it on the morning of last August 31st. Uh, and I remember it was right in the middle of my house being painted. I was sitting in my kitchen with the windows open and about 30 men on ladders around my house. It was like being inside a beaver dam. And uh, I started this book and I am a very slow reader. I finished this book just in time to tear out of the house for a dinner party. I have never read a book in a single day. Um, people say that, you know, I read this book in a single sitting and I had that experience. And I had that experience because I honestly could not shut the cover of my computer. Um, and it's, it, for those who haven't read it yet, and it, it just came out, um, so you probably haven't, it's a book that takes place on a single day in the life of a woman who's at a very important moment in her life, uh, but it also takes us across the landscape of her whole life up to that point. Um, it's a dark novel, it's a very funny novel, and it's a novel that really stays with you. So we're gonna begin uh, by, Jessica's gonna read a short scene, um, and then I'll start asking some questions. So Jessica, take it away. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'd like to echo what Julie said about thanking uh, Belmont Books, in particular, uh, Stacy and Kaylee, for working so hard to put this event together. It's, and it's a real treat for me to have Kaylee moderating, because it was only a few years ago that we were in a classroom together discussing her excellent stories. Uh, a big thank you to everybody here for attending. Um, we know it was kind of a circuitous route uh, to get here, and we can now reveal that it was an elaborate role-playing game to let you, the audience, know what it is like to be inside my character of Roberta, who very much wishes things had gone one way and pretty much they go the other. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, seriously, I really appreciate all of you following the links. I'm incredibly grateful to Julie for the support she's shown me uh, for this book from the beginning. She's gone way above and beyond. And since I'm a very big fan of both Julie and her writing, it's an honor to have her in my corner and on my screen tonight. And finally, if nobody minds, I'd like to give a shout out to my friend, August Henry, who I'm guessing is the youngest person in the room, probably by a lot. He will be eight next month. Uh, I told him yesterday that I was really nervous about this event. and. He, he said, when he's in a play at school or camp, uh, the best thing to do if you mess up is just keep going. So if I mess up, I'm just going to keep going. And thanks to Augie for the advice. Um, and in the spirit of just keep going, I'll read this uh, very short excerpt that Julie mentioned. And to set it up, uh, my character Roberta is the narrator. And she's had a serious falling out with her son, Will, who's a first year college student. Uh, he hasn't spoken to her or seen her in months, but then he does decide to bring his new girlfriend, whose name is Soshi, home for Thanksgiving. And Roberta is desperate for the visit to go well. And spoiler alert, it doesn't. Uh, this scene takes place after Thanksgiving dinner, uh, which they spend with Roberta's best friend, Gretty, and her family. After dessert, we went for our traditional post-Thanksgiving ramble through the part of the woods that hadn't been raised yet for the new development. I tried not to think that it would probably be my last one. Secretly, I hoped that the neighbors fighting the developer would win, so there'd always be a place for Gretty to walk and think of me. Maybe so she would stay in the picture, and maybe she wouldn't. It wasn't for me to say. I just wanted my son to be happy, that's all. That's all I want. Gretty sent us away with leftovers. So she fell asleep in the car on the way home. In the rear view, I saw her lean her head against Will's shoulder. He reached around with the other arm to close her in. I suppose I could have said something to him then, but it wasn't the right time. And who knew how lightly she might be sleeping? At home, helping me put the food away while he was in his room, so she murmured, you love Grady, don't you? I wondered if she noticed that my hands jumped a little as they placed the foil wraps in the fridge. Of course I love her. She's my best friend and Will's godmother. It was all I could do not to take one of those hands and press it against my chest because of the fluttering I felt there. But I wouldn't have wanted Soshi of all people to see this. 
It would have given her information I didn't want her to have. No, I don't mean just that. She shook that red hair of hers, not like a friend. You love her, I think. That's what it looks like to me. Was she trembling inside when she said this? I couldn't tell if it intimidated her in any way to assert such a thing to the mother of her boyfriend. Doing my best to keep my voice steady, I told her, I'm not sure why you're saying these things to me. She gave an expression I interpreted as a smirk until I saw that it was not mean. Does he know, she asked, as she nodded in the direction of Will's room. Does she? Couldn't she have asked me something else, like what Will had been like as a child, or where I had grown up, or whether I liked my job? But no, you love Gretty, don't you? No one, not even Gretty, had understood me so well after so little time. Thanks. Th thank you, Jessica. Um, and I think you know that that's a great scene to have read because it it introduces everyone here to what the essential constellation of relationships in this novel is. And each one is so rich and unique. And the relationship that Roberta has with her son, um, who wants something from her, he wants a piece of knowledge that she feels she can't give him, and, and it has led to their being estranged, is kind of the beating heart of the book, I think. And yet, it's the relationships with the women in, in the book that Roberta has that um, that I found, I just, I kind of read the book really quickly again yesterday and today, and, and um, there's the relationship, obviously, with Gretty, her best friend since college, uh, and it's a very intense friendship, um, a close friendship, and yet there are secrets, very significant secrets that Roberta has kept from, from, uh, from Gretty. Uh, there is also with in this book, the relationship with with Soshi, a wonderful character. The 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 as someone who's had two twenty something sons bring their girlfriends home, uh, I really appreciated that Thanksgiving scene. And uh, and and by the way, the Thanksgiving dinner that precedes the scene is one of the most fabulous Thanksgivings gone wrong, involving politics and booze, and that I have ever read. I love that scene. Um, uh, but then there's also the relationship with a neighbor named Pascal, a woman who has been close to Roberta, but Roberta has kind of pushed her away for reasons we discover. And then in flashbacks, there are relation her relationships with her mother, who was a single mother and an alcoholic, and also her grown sister, Stephanie. And all you, you circle in and out of these relationships as you go with Roberta through this one day that begins with a simple task that she has to do while Gretty is on vacation, She's supposed to go move the, the garbage bins. And of course, it doesn't go as it should. And, um, and the novel unfolds from there. But I wanted to start by asking you, Jessica, the question that, you know, I think everybody wants to ask an author when they have a new book is, what was the spark, the seed for this book? You know, was it a character, a relationship, a landscape? Could you, could you talk about that? Uh, it was a... Um... A situation that I was in. I was actually in the same situation. I'll bring up my friend August again. He and his mother asked me to come move their um, recycling bins and trash bins while they were on vacation, which I was happy to do. And I was rereading at the time, Mrs. Dalloway. And it was a beautiful summer day. I was driving over and I almost, I didn't hear the voice in the car because that might make it sound like something it wasn't, but I, I heard a line in my mind's ear, which I think for other writers who might be you know, listening, they, they understand what that's like. You know, the first line of Mrs. Dalloway is, uh, Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. Very mundane task, you know, that opens up a whole novel that all takes place in a day. And I, I heard some version of it was a simple task that lay before her, she was to move the bins. And uh, there, was, there was nothing complicating, you know, my particular um, situation. It was a very simple task to perform, but being a fiction writer, I think I, I had that automatic thought, well, how can I complicate this? And how can I make, how can I give it a conflict and make it into a story? And um, the other part of that uh, was that that was in the summertime and a few months before that, I myself had been uh, diagnosed with and treated for cancer, which now seems to be a, in, in my own rear view mirror, which I'm happy to say. Um, but that was on my mind, uh, that experience and also the thoughts I had during that time. And, you know, since about mortality and uh, um, how how much we want to be known, how much um, before 
you know, we, we can't tell our secrets anymore, or we can't just say the things to people that we would like to say. So I think it was, it was those two things. It was uh, having this, this very ordinary experience um, of moving the bins and then coupling that somehow psychically, um, although of course I had no idea how it was gonna play out um, with the more dramatic experience of going through this um, kind of serious illness. Um, so one thing I'm not sure that we mentioned though, and that's different between, and, and obviously you made this conscious choice about Roberta, is that she has recently had a recurrence. You know, she had every reason to believe that she had beat the cancer and now it's back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she has in fact withheld the fact that it's recurred from her son Will, um, and so there's a kind of urgency for her about these secrets that she's been keeping from Greddy, from from Will, even from Pascal, her neighbor. Are they? Is she going to reveal them? And is there only so much time in which to do so? Uh, and you know what's interesting to me, Jessica, is how much shame is also a subject of this book and how, um, you know, for some people keeping secrets is an issue of privacy, you know, it's not your business. But, but for Roberta, who's this very sensitive, um, not shy per se, but she's someone who's very empathic with everyone in the world except herself. That's kind of the feeling that I Oh, have. I like that description. She, she, she really, I mean, she's a little cranky, but you, know, you see her traveling through the world and looking at people going about their business in this suburb where she lives and, and kind of judging them and then judging herself or judging them. But she's so hard on herself. I think that for me was one of the most heartbreaking things about her character. Um, but I'd like to talk about the title because I have to say when you told me the title of the book, I didn't ask you about it. I thought, you know, let the book reveal the title. It, and it's a really fascinating um, the genesis of the title is fascinating. Would you, would you talk about that? Sure, thank you. Um, I like the fact that it's different, you know, and, and so it might be people's interest in it. Um, the, the Gretchen question is, is from the German phrase uh, de Gretchenfrage, which I may be mutilating in terms of pronunciation. Um, it comes from the Faust, the play, um, in which Faust is asked by his own Gretchen in the play, you know, she asks him, are you a religious man? very much looking for a particular answer from him at which he knows and he can't tell her the truth because uh he's he can't tell her the truth that he's made a pact with the devil because he he doesn't want uh his gretchen to know that so it's come to mean um a question particular to every individual the the one question that you don't want to be asked because to answer it truthfully would reveal more than you want to about yourself um, and it and it play and it and it and it plays into other relationships she has where she thinks about the question that she mustn't, you know, ask her sister. There's a, there's a literal Gretchen question in the book, um, but then of course, it, you know, there are different there are layers of it in here. That's right. So so, Roberta. By the way, one of the the sort of sub themes in the in the book that I love too is the relationship that Roberta has to her job. She does medical coding, which is a job that I had heard of, but I didn't know what's really involved, which is really in a way, while you do the work, you absorb these stories of these patients you will never meet and you mustn't share that information. It's very private. Um, and she has actually a, a relationship with her female coworkers at the hospital. Um, but this is when, you, when you're hearing about her job is when you find out that she was an English major in college. But of course, she's a single mother who has to support this son. So she you know, gets this very practical job. But I love the way that literature in a very light fashion, you know, recurs, you know, her, not whether it's Milton or it's Faust. And there's this beautiful quote that I just, that um, Roberta keeps above her desk. And it's a quote from Emerson. And I'm just going to read it because it made me think a lot about this, this novel itself. And the quote from Emerson is, finish each day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities have crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. Um, and, and that's very much an important thought for the whole course of, of this novel. Um, but also, I want to mention again, especially because 
there's so many dark things to this book. Um, and I did curse you for breaking my heart after I finished the book. I remember sending you a yeah, note saying, you. you know, thanks a lot, Jessica. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are some really laugh out loud scenes. And, and also as you're following the, this wonderful stream of consciousness, like early on in the novel, she runs into this obnoxious tennis pro who was really kind of abusive to her son and his friend. When, and he asks her for a recommendation and she has this very awkward conversation with him. And then he goes away and then she's thinking about Mrs. Galloway, which she's reading. And then this leads her into thinking about believing in God and the time earlier in her life when she actually came close to attempting suicide. And I just love this, um, again, I'm just gonna read this short paragraph. I don't think God designs or manipulates things like an architect or a puppeteer. When I imagined killing myself, I didn't consider it an affront to destiny or to some master plan. No, my God would not lay blame or shame on my forehead in receiving me back to the fold. I know, he'd say, in whatever language he used to communicate. And is it possible to begin learning that language while we're still alive? I know, you tried, it's not for everyone. And, and that, that made me laugh out loud. Um, Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate yeah. it, especially you saying what you do about the quotes and the writers and the, um, <laughs> You know, I wanted to, I have so many, not just quotes, but you know, writer's sensibilities or things that I've read that I did want to incorporate into Roberta's consciousness and, and her own sensibility. So I, for you to say that it's done lightly and I hope believable, believably is a, is a great compliment. So thank you. You're welcome. So, um, so you, you talked about Virginia Woolf and, and Mrs. Dalloway. Um, are there other authors that have, that you feel have sort of influenced you in, in the writing of, of this book? Um, I don't think so much in this one. I think it really was, uh, even though the style is different, um, because I end up using the first person, I really, once I realized I was going to, you know, kind of make an homage to uh, Virginia Woolf, I, I kind of tried to keep her voice in my head. And I, I just kind of see them both as books. I mean, they're very different, of course, you know, they're very different mm -hmm. books, but um, I do, I, I like the structure of uh, both women set off at the beginning of the day to do these uh, ordinary tasks. They go out into the world, they encounter people, they witness things, mm -hmm. they talk to people, things happen to them. And most importantly, I think in both uh, memories are triggered, you know, um, yeah. about, from their own lives. And at the end of the day, I think they both understand more about themselves and who they are than they did at the beginning by virtue of you know this experience. So um, I, I can't re remember exactly if there were any other voices in my head. I think that was the one that uh, I was consciously trying to you know keep there. Mm -hmm. So um, are there other novels you can think of that are written in a single day that have maybe I, I was trying to think of other novels I've read, and I know there are many, but the one, one that comes to mind, I don't, I didn't have an answer prepared, but I know that Ian McEwan's Saturday, which is a book oh yes, books. I love that book. Yeah. That's a yeah. great one. Yes, was, and it, yeah, maybe that was in the back of my mind because I really love the idea of of do, of trying to do that. And and by the way, not to interrupt, but you are my ideal reader because even though I knew it's difficult for people, um, I really love it if someone could actually finish it in a sitting, just because it is kind of you know all all inside her head. And, and uh, so I, I appreciate that you had that experience, even I though it was really... there was so much noise going on all around. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs barking. And, um, so, uh, so talk about the creation of uh, Roberta's relationship with Greti, which is so um, important. And so, and, and the interesting thing is that almost exclusively we see Greti in, in, in flashback. I mean, that's true for a lot of the characters, but um, the whole trajectory of their friendship and the way that it's influenced her life. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to do any, you know, I don't want to spoil anything. So I don't know what you want to- Yeah, attend, I could just but. say, I think that she's, um, Greti was someone she met in college, Roberta met in college and right away made an impression and was not only the person that even if she doesn't say it this way to herself, Roberta would have loved to have been. Uh, she's also someone who, uh, she wants to orbit uh, Gretty. I think I mm -hmm. used a, um, an analogy like that in the book. And so um, I think part of 
the tension that I mean for them to have had ever since is, you know, what is the extent, what's the level, what's the nature of um, Roberta's affections or feelings for Gretty. And I, I think that she herself is not necessarily always clear. There are times in her life when she feels they're clearer than others, but she, it's also very clear to her, you know, um, Gretty moves from where they've gone to college to Boston and Gretty, Gretty gets married and starts a family. So it's not as if, you know, uh, Roberta thinks that she's, you know, going to be uh, more than a friend to Gretty. She does follow Gretty to Boston. Then they both have their, their children around the same time. And so for a while that shores her up because they share that experience and it's something that they have in common. But um, I think in terms of a secret, I think one of the things that's troubled her all along that I hope Roberta herself gets some relief from in the course of the book is wondering how much Gretty understands about how Roberta feels about her. I, I do hope and think I meant to resolve that by the end that, of the book that um, she, she understands that Gretty has, has gotten it. So um, at least that's what I meant to portray. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. No, there's also, there's a very revealing passage where, um, and I think it was, it's about the first time that Roberta got her initial diagnosis and she has a really hard time telling her best friend because she realizes she's afraid that Reddy won't react with as much emotion as mm -hmm. she wants her to, which is an interesting, um, interesting psychologically. So, and she so, probably would. I mean, I think, and she does. That's the thing, you know, but she just has the fear that, oh, if that happens, you know, the worst fear, then I actually will be alone because she also hasn't told her son because she's afraid of yeah. um, adding too much burden to him at a time when he's, you know, needing to study and try to get into college and thinks he won't be able to handle it. Yeah, I also love the way in which you portray her relationship with her son Will at, at different stages of his growing up, all the way from his being this little boy who strokes her arm in this comforting gesture to being this young man who's very angry. And I, I can say what it is, right? That he, maybe you've even already well, sure. said it. Of course. What he, so what he wants to know is who, who is his father? Who, you know, he has grown up with just a mother and, um, you know, not to go into my books too much, but I, one of my novels in the dark sacred night begins with a a man who has never been told by his mother who his biological father is and he is angry with her about it um he's though he's four, he's in his 40s and some people said to me oh it's not believable that a mother would never tell her son that of course every child wants to know if they're raised by one parent who the other is you know did you encounter any pushback like that I, it's not true as it turns out i mean there are many cases in which a single parent, a mother particularly, feels that for her son to know the true story of his conception um, is, is going to be too much to take. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you I, talk to people about that experience or? Um, you mean people who'd have I mean, Yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 um, no, I didn't. I went to great lengths because when you talked earlier about uh, Roberta feeling shame, I think that some of that is probably rightful. I mean, she's justified, I think, in in um, feeling that it's wrong. Uh, it's wrong on the one hand not to give him information that she can. I mean, she's she's told him a story all his life that he. She's believed. created an elaborate story. She created a story that he did believe um, for much of his life, and then as he became a teenager and as he becomes the age in the book he starts to realize that uh, it, it never was true and that she's not telling him the truth when she says, I can't tell you. I mean, she is, she thinks, you know, telling the truth. But I think that, you know, she, she, um, she knows that he deserves to know. She's just making a calculation knowing him as well as she does and knowing what she knows that, uh, that it's, it's not the, at least it's not the right time now to tell him. And, you know, she's also not sure how much time does she have. It's a right. luxury she thought she had at one point. Now maybe she doesn't. So that's part of what she has to decide too. But um, I did go to great lengths because I knew it was a, a, a difficult, you know, situation to weigh. It would be for a mother. So I, I did really try to get into all the, all the things she was thinking as she continued to um, withhold this from him. Yeah. And there's, the, there's that scene too. And this, this affects me a lot too. When he's home, for Thanksgiving with the girlfriend and he 
I don't know whether she invites him to where he decides to go into the garage and deal with his childhood belongings. And she goes away with Sochi and to go shopping and they come back and he has put everything, everything out on the curbside yeah. as trash. Yeah. And, you know, the feeling of a mother that the child has just discarded this, in, this entire childhood. And of course, as soon as he leaves, she goes and takes it all back into the garage. <laughs> Most of it anyway. Yeah, all of most it. of it. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my um, impulse, I know. <laughs> there's also this wonderful recurring metaphor that has to do with the game shoots and ladders, which um, I didn't realize could be so scary for some children. I, I think some of us played Candyland in some point. Oh, if you have shoots to go down ladders. that chute, Julie. No, going down that chute. <laughs> well, I've got a metaphor for mortality. I I don't know if it's scary so much as that you you know you know you're gonna lose if you go all the way back down. But uh, but right. and thank you, Augie, for that too. <laughs> so um, so I guess uh, the the only other question I'd like to ask you, and then I, I if I didn't ask you something or you want to add more, uh, that would be great. Is uh, you know this is your sixth book. Uh, how do you see this novel in relation to your previous books? I mean, is is it different in some ways? Are there do you, each time that you finish a book, I wonder, do you see recurring themes? Um, is, you know, how, how does Roberta relate to your, to your other characters, that, that your other protagonists? Oh, I appreciate that question. Um, and it's funny because I, you probably, maybe you know this from experience, I don't know, we haven't discussed it, but, you know, I often don't see the things that are there that other people tell me that are there. But in this case, having thought about it once I finish this, I do tend to write about people who um, have psychological conflicts. And one of my favorite ones is, um, or the one that I find most fascinating, I should say, is people who know something on one level, they know the truth. And yet it is dangerous to them to acknowledge the truth to themselves, let alone to anybody else. Yes. And so they make a choice at some level, I don't know at what level of consciousness it is, how mm -hmm. varied it is, to believe something else because it's easier and it's more, um, it's just more bearable. You know, they still know the truth, and yet they, they go to great lengths to, uh, to believe something else. And um, I don't see, I actually was very much trying, I do have a couple of, you know, uh, characters, both in, in novels and stories that are like that. And I actually, with this book, was trying to write a different character. And the difference that I see is that probably because of the nature of her health condition, um, Roberta probably was more like that, but now because she is where she is, uh, what's happening and what the truth is can't be hidden anymore. So the way I, I see her in my mind, the truth is there. It's visible to her. It's over there. Uh, she keeps it at arm's length, but she's never pushing it away so much that it's not part of her consciousness. So that is the main difference, I would say, between this book and some of the others that I've written. Thanks for that question. Oh, that, that's, that's interesting. And in fact, I was thinking, you know, there's a conversation that Roberta has with her son who's majoring in psychology toward the end of the book about a certain kind of blindness. There's, I, can't, I was trying to look for the term. Do you remember? It's, it's not selective blindness, but it's how people can basically not see things right in front of them. There's that famous study where people were asked to look at some film and, there are, and they miss the gorilla, right. the, the guy right. dressed as a gorilla, I'm something like that. I'm thinking of the phrase willful blindness because I was just looking at it and I'm not sure if that's what that study yeah. shows, but it is true. You expect to see something, so you, you just- Right, so, so sometimes what I want to, wanted to say is some of my favorite protagonists are, as I like to say, you know, characters that you just want to reach through the pages and shake them. Like, can't you see? You know, don't be so foolish, you know, human folly. And, and I thought, what's I've interesting. I've a lot of those. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what's interesting um, about Roberta is it's as if she knows everything, but she, you know, she's very, she keeps it all close. And you see her through the book kind of looking at something and then looking away, looking at it and looking away. So it's not that she can't see, you know, what's going on inside of her and the things she's withholding from the world. She's not withholding them from herself. Mm -hmm. She... She, and in a way, maybe it's also not just shame, but, but not trusting enough that, that people love her enough to, to forgive her, to um, be with her in, in her folly and in, you know, things in her life that are so painful that the idea of sharing them um, makes her just much too vulnerable. And, and at one point she does 
acknowledged to herself that one of the reasons that she had a child on her own was to have someone to really love her. And I think that some of what you've captured is some of the, the it, very honestly, is some of what, you know, there's an aspect to becoming a parent that's very selfish. You know, we don't want to just give unconditional love. We want to get that unconditional love. And Will's love is, Will is a tough and sensitive and smart kid who perceives a lot more about his mother than she could have imagined. And um, I appreciate that, Julie. You know, there's, a, there's a phrase that um, I love that I, I, I do try to think of a lot when I'm writing, and I think it applies to Roberta more than anybody that I've written, just because of the nature of her situation. And it's, it's, it's the extreme situation that best reveals what we are essentially. And, and I really appreciate what you said about her not recognizing that the people in her life probably would, uh, you know, if, yeah. if, if she had let them in sooner in the way that she eventually does or wants to, things might have been different. So it's meant to be sad, but not terrible, you know, not, not as bad as it could be, you know, I, so <laughs> I actually wanted to set out to write a happy ending of this book, which nobody will believe if they read it. But. Well, you know, and there are some, just there are some lovely cameos. There's this scene where she stops to, this woman flags her down. I mean, there's a woman, she's actually sort of stalking this woman in a way, but it doesn't, that doesn't matter. The, the woman flags her down, doesn't know her and asks her to come help her get a cat off a roof. And the conversation that they have while she holds the ladder so this woman can go up and retrieve her cat off the roof is just, you know, it's like this beautiful, there are these little cameos that are set into the novel. So I guess, you know, maybe the last thing I'd ask you before we open it up is, Roberta is such a fully realized, intense character. Did, did you have a hard time leaving her behind? I mean, I, I was haunted by her for quite oh, a while after finishing the book. Thank I mean, you. Um, do you have no, characters that stay with you more than others? She would no, certainly I think be about them. I mean, in some ways it was a relief just because it was painful to inhabit her. I mean, obviously I wasn't going through what she was going through on, in any way. Um, but as you know, when we, we, we have to inha inhabit our characters in their internal landscapes when we're trying to, otherwise we can't excavate them and then, <laughs> then render them. Um, so no, I, I did feel quite tender toward her. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I had finished telling what her story was, and I and I hope yeah. I did. But thank thank you for asking that. Thank you yeah, for and it, and and the book comes to it. You know, I really like a lot of good books. You know, I, I thought, how in the world is this book going to end? And you know, it ended in a in a very you really brought it to a full ending. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Julie. So uh, thank so anyway, thank thank you and. Um, we're, I think we're going to bring Kaylee back in because she's the collector of the questions. So Kaylee, wherever you are, come back on screen. And uh, Hi, Kaylee. Hi. <laughs> well, this is just wonderful. Um, so we've already started getting a few questions. Um, just want to remind everybody, because a few people did join late, we are keeping um, cameras and audio off. So if you have questions that you want us to ask the authors or just nice comments, um, you can put those in the chat, which is the nice know. comments. <laughs> <laughs> those are easy to read. <laughs> I might not have time to read all of the, the kind comments, <laughs> um, but we will save the chat and, and give it to both authors <laughs> so they can read it later at least. Um, Thanks, everyone. Okay, so um, to start out with, I think for both of you, um, you know, this has obviously been a really strange time these last few months. Um, so a couple of people are wondering, what has it been like for you writing during this time? And has your process changed at all? Jessica, you, you, you go I first, Jessica. Know. Okay, I, I, I will, although Julie's the one who's closing in on the end of her new novel, but <laughs> maybe um, for me, I, I, it's a little bit hard to separate um, because the timing kind of has coincided with this book coming out um, when I might or might not have been more, you know, diving right into something new. Um, but I, I, I've actually found it when I can concentrate, the first few weeks it was very difficult to concentrate as I'm sure a lot of people can identify with, whether it's writing or some other kind of work. I've had people say to me, I used to read all the time, now I can't read because I can't concentrate and, and the opposite. So that's kind of interesting. I think that's an individual thing. Um, one thing I found that's uh, actually been kind of freeing is that because I have no idea, and I don't know if anybody does, how any of this might affect the publishing industry, I feel a bit like a little kid again and much freer to just sit down. I don't, I don't start at the computer. I start with a notebook and a pen mm -hmm. to just sit down and, uh, and 
I don't necessarily think of it as free writing, but to write something without any thought as to whether it's going to appeal to, you know, my agent and editor or reader down the road, just to more to, I wouldn't call it play, but just, you know, more freedom to, to kind of see, well, what, what, what can I do here that, the way I did when I was much younger? But I know that Julie's in a, in a much different situation now and I'm going to commit you again about to finish her latest novel. Well, yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for putting that pressure on me, Jessica. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I am working on a novel I've been working on for a few years and, I, and uh, without going into details, I will say that the, um, I keep wanting to call it the pandemonium and, and it is a pandemonium, but the pandemic has, has really um, kind of blindsided the book that I'm working on, just in terms of its storyline, but it's workable. Um, but I found for the first uh, couple of months, I mean, we're I think into month four maybe of life having been mm -hmm. overturned, um, that a lot of my writing energy has gone into really intense email correspondences with friends that I can't be together with, um, kind of processing the the emotions and the daily experiences of this. And I've also really thrown myself into cooking and baking. And um, I've had both grown sons home and uh, I took my dogs for a distance checkup a couple of weeks ago. And I uh, discovered that they had each of them lost five pounds, which was sort of remarkable because nothing seemed different. And I thought, well, I know where those 10 pounds went. <laughs> <laughs> But it's been, but I, I'm, I'm getting back into it, into a routine, so it's possible. Well, we're, we're going to look for it and I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So Leslie asked um, if you have any tips for writing humor, especially dark humor. And Julie's very good at this too, although hers is, is not necessarily dark. <laughs> hers is just straightforward humor. I actually appreciate Julie's having said that there was humor in mine because I think of it more as being quirky so that some of those, um, what would you call them, encounters that Roberta has with people. Um, to me, if they're humorous, it's in the sense that I think that they're like the kinds of things that happen to me sometimes where I I don't know how I got myself into these situations and I don't know what to make of them once I'm out of them. Um, I think that, uh, that the, the line that you quoted, Julie, about, you know, kind of imagining what God might say if you uh, left, left the party early. Um, <laughs> no, it's not for everyone. And I think I have, I think I have the, um, Roberta's mother at some point saying, you know, she, she, when she herself was dying said, uh, you know, certain parts I could have done without, but on the whole, I liked it, you know, and, and Roberta and her sister think, you know, as if it were a movie review or something. But <laughs> just to answer Leslie's question, um, I think uh, to me, it's just, uh, if you are really in the scene and people are really speaking, then I think just naturally, um, whether it's, you know, straight up humor or dark humor, it will just come out because that's how people speak. I mean, that's, that's my, my hope anyway. You know, I think that for me, and it's definitely true for you, a, a lot of the humor in my books comes out of the way we regard ourselves, the way we watch ourselves move through the world and interact with people and go, well, you know, did I just say that? Did I? Or the thing that you might have said, but you didn't say. Um, and, you know, just observing our own foolishness and our foibles. And um, it comes out of introspection, you know? I, I think the older I get, the, the more I laugh at myself. Uh, both inside and, and, and outside. So um, that's a good way to put it. I, I join you in that. <laughs> <laughs> and we can laugh at each other. So. <laughs> Only other, other... says it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a nice juicy one. Um, mm. Lori and Anne want to know, did writing this book lead you to reveal some secrets or feel that some secrets should be revealed or did it make it, you hang on to them more? Oh, Lori and Anne, thank you very much <laughs> for that question. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, you know, I had someone ask me on a, a kind of a podcast interview. So, you know, did you have a secret? And I, I thought the next question was going to be, depending on how I answered, what was it? Which I thought was quite funny. Um, I think for me, uh, just be, I haven't revealed any secrets that I had um, that I 
want to tell before I die. Don't know if I will. It did make me think about the, the, um, the situation that, that I might be in or someone might be in someday. Um, but I think, I feel like as a fiction writer, um, the secrets are kind of in the fiction to be found by readers if they want to find them. Find them. Um, and so I, I, to me, when I'm reading fiction, that's much more interesting maybe than what the author, him or herself, um, might directly say. You know, I love reading many books by an author and kind of getting to know that person's sensibility. So, um, so I, I don't know if that answers their question, but <laughs> that's my best shot. <laughs> I'm holding, the, I'm holding on to them. That's the real answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've decided not to reveal yeah. <laughs> not, at the, not at the moment. <laughs> no, I, what you said about reading a whole, an author's work and seeing recurring things in them. I'll never forget reading a, a review of, of one of my, I think it was my fourth or fifth book where it said, you know, Julia Glass sure can do geezers. You know, it was like this old cranky old man. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm just a cranky old man. You know, maybe that's my secret. <laughs> but I often think about that. I can sure do geezers. <laughs> that's funny. Well, wow, that seems like, um, Maybe a good transition, maybe a bad transition, you can explain. Um, Catherine asks, I understand your husband is also a writer. Uh, this is for Jessica. Um, what is that like? And do you offer each other advice? And I know this Catherine. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Uh, she's a, um, and, and she knows my husband who is, is a writer, a very good fiction writer. And um, advice, I take much more advice from him than, uh, I ever give. Um, he's a very good first reader for my work. We don't write the same kind of thing. I think that would be difficult. I don't know what it's like when um, people or partners are close to people who um, do write the same kind of thing. I can't imagine what that would be like. Um, but he's a very good first reader. And my experience of it <laughs> is that it's very helpful once I get over the fact that the way he does it is to ask me a lot of questions. And they're very good questions. And I recognize that when he's asking them and I don't have answers and I get very angry <laughs> at, at the time. And he's very good about weathering that. But, um, you know, there are always questions that, that in the privacy of my office and uh, in the book I can, uh, I can go back and use. So, um, so yes, it's very nice that way. Cause he knows, he knows, you know, what it's like if I say, I'm going to go for a walk and think about my story. He knows what that's like. So. So, so, what, so tell us a question or two that he asked about the Gretchen question, about the novel. Oh, goodness. Do um, you remember any? You know, it's been a while, um, and I can't specifically. He tends to ask, um, you know, questions about, um, you know, if, if you do include that, what's the purpose of it? You know, and then I get angry because, well, it's in there. That's all. It's, I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason, but you, you see what I'm saying? It's a much more, re it's a reasoned question when what I've just done is just kind of, um, you know, put all what's intuitive out on the page or on the screen. And uh, so he's very good at making me focus on, on um, you know, how does anything relate, how is anything relevant to the story? Does that seem belong there? Would it be better, you know, at the end? What, what, what's it doing here? You know, basically that kind of thing, so. <laughs> Thank you, honey. <laughs> so I actually, I, I feel like I have to ask a follow-up question then um, for both of you. Do you have um, set readers that you always show your drafts to? And now that you've written so many books, are those readers the same people or are, have those readers changed? I, I've always, um, I mean, I started my career before I met my husband, but I've always, um, you know, since, since him, he's, he's been a first reader. People in my family, my mother, my sisters are very good readers. I have a couple of other very close friends um, who are in my acknowledgments who are also excellent readers for me. And they aren't necessarily writers. I do have some writer friends that read them at different stages, but, um, and I find that really helpful because they're very um, insightful readers. But they, so, so that's actually more helpful to me sometimes than, um, than getting uh, feedback from writers. Um, but I've always, you know, I've been in writing, writers groups when I was younger and shared things, and now it's much more informal for me. And I, I, I think, and I'm not sure what Julie's process is. Uh, so 
you know, uh, Jessica and I both uh, teach uh, graduate MFA students at Emerson College. And, you know, I always have to confess to my students when we begin a workshop that I, I did not get an MFA and I did not even major in English or creative writing in college. I was actually a painter. And so um, when I changed over from painting to writing fiction, which was really kind of my late 20s, early 30s, I did it very much on my own. And I didn't share work because I didn't have fellow writers in my life, really. So um, when I, my hus husband, who was, you know, my boyfriend during part of this, would, I'd show him chapters or something. And <laughs> the problem was he's a very good reader, but I don't let him read anymore until the very end because he will read something and say, oh, this guy, Joe, that's our friend Tom. And I'll say, no, it's not. You know, and then I'll go back to working on it and suddenly it's our friend Tom. So, you know, I just said, that's it. You know, you're cut off. And, but so because of that, I, people have offered to read for me during my writing. And sometimes I'm tempted to say yes, but the way I work is really, I wait until I have a pretty solid draft and then it goes to my, so then my husband gets to read it and my um, agent and my editor. Uh, and I've had the same editor for all six books, same agent too. I'm very lucky that way. So they really know my process. They know my work. Um, this most recent book, I actually did have a beta reader. Um, and that was uh, a, a friend who I, who has been a brilliant editor uh, and who's a novelist that I really admire also named um, David Ebershoff. And I, he was read the, the draft, the finished draft of my last book. And that was a new reader for me. And he really helped me a lot in the very final stages of that book. But I still just feel like I'm so used to work just marinating in my own characters for so long without sharing it. Um, but that's, that's how I still work. And I don't do it in pieces either. I wait till I have, you know, at least yeah. a chunk to, because, you know, at some point, you, you know that it's going to change yourself anyway. So you might as well wait till, you know, that's, a, that's how I feel. I also have to say about my husband, who I sort of just there, but you know, he's the first, he's always the first male reader. And that can be very, that can be very important. Like he'll say, you know, no guy would ever say this or, you know, and then we can <laughs> argue about it. But um, <laughs> I'd so. like to be a fly on the wall for that. That's all. Oh, you would. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, well, Trish Reed asks, for Jessica and Julia, what writers are inspiring you the most recently? Mm. Trish, thank you for being here. Trish is a, also a former student, I think um, longer ago than Kaylee. Um, I appreciate that question. You know who I've, I've, I've been so inspired by uh, is uh, Elizabeth Strout in the Olive Kittredge books. I just find those, and some of her other writing too. I've been reading those um, more recently, and I just think it's amazing how uh, she can talk about writing both the whole spectrum of emotion. I mean, she, it's funny and it's it's heartbreaking, and um, so I've been reading, kind of diving into her lately. I've been reading Julia Glass, the ones that I have not read before, reading House Among the Trees right now, and and loving it the way I loved all of hers. I said to her the other day that um, she's one of the few writers that if I somehow miss a sentence or don't read a sentence closely enough, I feel that I've missed something. And by that, I don't mean a piece of action. I mean, I have missed an elegant sentence that, that I don't want to have missed. So um, so lately, I'm looking around. L lately, those are the, the people uh, that I've been reading. I don't no, sure. you know, I, it's, it's, it's interesting to, we, we, you talked about reading, you know, during this lockdown and um, I, I, I was one of the people who found it pretty hard to read in the beginning mm -hmm. and I, um, I, I read all across the map, although I have been reading contemporary uh, books. I know some people who are like, enough of this contemporary, I'm going back and reading the dead people and I, or, or reading the classics. I think, I think I read somewhere that bookstores are selling a lot more classics like Dickens and Tolstoy and, you know, then they've sold. So, or Jane Austen or whoever. But um, I have to say a book that I read that got me back into reading that I could not put down is uh, Fleischman is in Trouble. Mm -hmm. um, I have not read a book like that before. And, and then I read 
another book that just really, I loved reading, um, Oh, If Beale Street Could Talk, James Baldwin, loved that. Then I read The Perfect Nanny, that, that scary, oh, I like that, by that French uh, yeah. author. Um, and and I'm, I'm getting very close to the end of The Topeka School by Ben Lerner. And, oh, and, um, but I have to say a couple of authors whose work I have just feasted on and love are in our audience, Margot Livesey and our colleague Steve Yarbrough are two novelists who are, you know, they, they have a new book out and I'm, I'm there. So I'm on that. You know, Margo has a new one coming out in um, August. Is it the oh, go Margo. I didn't yeah, know about that. Boy in the Field. Forgive me, Margo, if I have the, if I have the title wrong. But as far as the Dickens, I forgot that I, I had not read David Copperfield before and am reading it now. So. You are. Yes. So, yes. And I'm embarrassed to say I hadn't. But anyway, thanks for the question, Trish. Okay, um, so Anastasia asks, for Jessica, what is the process of choosing each character's name? <laughs> Hi, Anna. Um, it's, it's, I appreciate that question because it actually is, uh, I go through a lot kind of trying to choose them. Um, and sometimes they're more meaningful than others. First, I try to do the logistical stuff by not having names that are too similar or start with a similar, you know, letter that's going to um, confuse the reader. Um, in this case, I actually had the name Gretty because I've always wanted to use it before I actually even had the concept of the Gretchen question or the title. It just ended up that the Gretchen question ended up uh, working as a theme. So um, I think uh, I've seen other writers say this, so I'm not embarrassed to say that I do consult, you know, name. Uh, lists <laughs> by Google. I used to have a name the baby book because it's also interesting to see what the names mean. And in Roberta's case, I specifically wanted her, she has the name Roberta and her sister has the name Stephanie because they're named after men in their mother's life. And so I wanted, it's a very small part of, of who she is, but um, it has to do with why she named her somewhat what she did. But um, so very often it does have to do with the character and uh, you know what I want to say about them. I'm curious about how Julie chooses her names because she has a Well, it's, it's so much fun because, you know, and I'll never forget naming my first son and how it seemed so dire and someone, and there were all these arguments with my husband and so on. And it just seemed like the most important choice. And someone said to me, you know what? It just becomes another word in your vocabulary. And during the years that you, you're very irritated with him, it will be like, <laughs> so, anyway. but, but so when you name characters, it's like getting to name a whole bunch of children. But the thing that I always tell my students is remember that unless a character renamed themselves, him or herself or themselves, um, that name tells you more about their parents than it does about that person. I mean, how do they, and there's actually a, a, a very funny example in your novel, Jessica, which is that Roberta's brother-in-law's name is Harley Davidson. Yeah. And it wasn't that he loves, it's that his parents were these avid, motorcyclists so and he's called Hal for short and the, he you know so Hal. and nicknames yeah. right and nicknames yeah. sometimes nicknames tell you about the character you know if someone chooses to be called by their entire name or so um in in fact naming characters helps me think about their parents yeah. and and that's a very important you know considering you know what Carol Shields calls the gene pool of a character you know all you, know, you have to understand the gene pool uh, so, so, you know, and once a character has had a name for quite a while, it's very hard to change it. Too. That's right. So. Thank you, Anna, for the question. Well, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, let me see. Um, okay, so Stephen asked about the future of the publishing industry um, for authors. Um, but since this is our last question, I'm going to put a little spin on it um, just to make it hopeful. <laughs> um, what, what do you hope to see in the next year um, in the publishing industry and in the world of being an author? I think, I mean, is it too, is it too simplistic to think that by virtue of having uh, been 
home more. I know, I know a lot of people are working harder than they did before. So I don't want to make the assumption because I know it's not true that people have more time necessarily, but there are those who do. Um, and, and maybe it's the case. I would love to think that people who previously liked to read uh, for pleasure and then kind of got waylaid by responsibilities and jobs um, were able at least to some measure to return to it during this time. And so that, that that might mean that things are more in demand and that we have more books in the future. I'm not a very, I'm not very attuned to the business side of, of publishing. So maybe that's naive, but that is my hopeful wish, Kaylee. Thanks for, for that spin. Yeah. I, I will say this, you know, my own agent with, with, with whom I've been in touch just on a personal level the last few months and a very close friend who is an agent are working their tails off. So, you know, the, the wheels of publishing are ever turning. And it's been interesting to see that some titles, some publishers have chosen to delay and, but many others are, you know, they're out there being published. And after all, we need books more than ever right now, I like to think. So, so that's the good, the good news. I do think though, I mean, two things about the moment that we're in. Um, one is that I, I certainly think that the um, very important societal uprising that we're seeing now in, in relation to Black, Black Lives Matter is going to have a lot to do with what publishers are paying attention to and, and publishing itself, you know, looking at yeah, already. the editors who are, you know, that's, that's definitely happening. But here's another thing, and, and Jessica, you and I both know this from teaching that our a lot of our students write speculative and, and dystopian fiction, and I have to wonder whether our reality, having suddenly become so dystopian, um, will in a way help bring dystopian and real, realistic fiction kind of together. I mean, if you think about, about writing a novel set in this moment, I mean, just reading your book today, Jessica, I think some characters hugged and I kind of went like this, like, don't do it. You know? So um, it's, you know, and, and I'm curious to see how now that, the, that we're living in science fiction, what will that, what does that mean? in terms of realism versus, versus science fiction, dystopia, fantasy, and so forth. So it sounds like stay tuned and we're all in for an interesting ride. Let's hope so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Great. Well, well thank, thank you, you so much. Th thank oh. you so much, Kaylee. Yeah, thanks to everyone. And Stacy and everybody. Thank you both very much. That was a wonderful discussion. Um, and I know that we're all looking forward to, to reading your new book. Um, Jessica, and thank you everybody who followed us from Zoom to Crowdcast and back to Zoom. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and we hope that you'll come back for more events in the future. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thank you. Don't forget to buy Jessica's book from Belmont Bookshop. And Julie's too. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Bye. Okay. Bye everyone. Thank you.